Okay, good morning again. Uh, welcome to our CS Summit Day 2. Uh, we are um, here with uh, Bethany Lindsay. We're going to talk to her, but I just wanted to let you know we had a great keynote last night with Dr. Amy Coe. We're going to uh, try to make that uh, available to those of you who missed it. Um, it's been uh, a, a nice first day. We will have some logistics for you too today before we go into the sessions as well. But first of all, I would like to introduce you to Bethany Lindsay. She is the Vice President of Education and Innovation for the Ada Developers Academy. Um, and uh, she has a lot to say about YCS. So Bethany. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> hello. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, hello. I see Bellevue, Issaquah, Colville. Keep, keep stuff coming in the chat. This is really fun. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Bethany Lindsay. I use she, her pronouns. And I'm gonna get us started this morning. All right, so I'm gonna do a little bit about who I am what ADA, like you see this ADA Developers Academy, what that is, who ADA serves, and why I'm here today. Um, and like, I love to get started with hearing all of your voices um, out there, because uh, I can't see you. Uh, so I'd love to hear your voices in the chat. So I'd love for us just to take a minute or two to reflect on your career. And what are one or two values that have guided you throughout your career? So I'm going to give us, a, I'm going to read it again, think about it. And as it comes to you, please just start putting in the chat. I'm going to read it one more time. Take a minute or two to reflect on your career. What are one or two values that have guided you? I've got a little word cloud here, if, if that's helpful as well. So I would love to hear. Serving others, sharing my love of CS. Great. Always keeps what's best for kids first. That's great. Curiosity and empowerment. Kids first always. We have a similar motto at Ada. We call it student-centered mindset. I love that. Access and equity. Bilingual education. This is great. Yes. So another similar, Beverly, I love that. Um, we also have another one that's called learning how to learn. That's one of our main learning uh, components. The core and voice, great. Integrity and equity. Be the one for every student. These are great. So we all have these values that have brought us into education and that are guiding us throughout our career. So I'm going to go on and talk to you a little bit about me and my values. Um, again, my name is Bethany Lindsay. I use she, her pronouns. I am the VP of Education and Innovation at Ada Developers Academy. And I just want to talk a little bit about my career path and where I'm coming from and how I got to where I am today. Um, and then you can see my values up there as well, which I think mine match a lot of y'all's. Uh, so this is really fun. Um, I have been in education for 20 years, and I have been in adult education specifically for the past 15 years. And I am from a very small town in uh, the middle of Missouri, uh, originally. And um, my, my career path was not, I would say, I don't know many people with like just very linear career paths, but my, my career path was definitely not a very linear career path because I didn't have a lot of role models to go off of. I didn't really know what was out there. Um, there's some, there's an, an interesting statistic that a lot of women don't have role, uh, um, older role, women that are role models for them because women haven't been in the workplace that long. So it was really interesting. What I knew was teaching, what I knew was learning. And that is actually, I tried to go into something different and I realized, no, I, teaching and learning is definitely still where I am. So um, I'm from a small town. I've been in adult education for a long time. I've lived everywhere from Missouri to Japan to Vermont, and I've been in Washington in the Seattle area for the past 14 years, and I love it here. I intended to come for a year or two, and I just can't seem to leave, so I'm going to be here for a while. Um, what I would say is about the adult education, my experience with education is that people are generally, when students find their way to me or to find our way to wherever I am in my career, um, they generally haven't found what they were looking for along the way yet. 
and they're still looking for it. So I think that that's where I'm so, why I'm so excited to talk to y'all today because you can help them find this so much earlier and avoid a lot of the, the heartache and the, and the um, situations that they experience. Um, as you can see in this picture, this is like where I am very comfortable. I'm, I'm very comfortable being in the middle of a bunch of other people that are very, very talented. And I love uh, helping support others utilize their talents to the best of their ability. Um, I went to the University of Leeds. I now work at Ada Developers Academy. I've worked at Presidio Graduate School. I've worked at Galvanize. I've worked in a lot of different places. So that is a little bit about me and why I'm here today. Now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Ada, um, um, Ada Developers Academy. Our mission is to change the face of tech, essentially. We work with women and gender expansive folks to get more. We work with um, women and gender expansive folks to get them into industry. And how we do that is we have a six month program, uh, a six month classroom program, which I know it sounds really, really fast. Um, believe me, I, I totally get this. <laughs> it is actually really fast. Um, but we have a six month program where they learn JavaScript, React, Flask, Python, HTML, CSS, SQL, um, and CS fundamentals. We don't expect them to learn all of it in that classroom phase because you can't. <laughs> it's not possible. So that's why I like that model, learning how to learn. Um, so we are really learning how to learn. Um, that six month of classroom instruction is free. It's we don't we do not charge our students anything. In fact, we make sure that our students are supported. We make sure that if students need access to housing or food, we make sure that we provide that. If our students don't have access to computers, we make sure to provide that. In Seattle, we're actually piloting a program where we're actually providing <clears throat> childcare to people who have children that are under a year old, because we really know that those are the barriers for women um, and gender expensive folks to get into any, to do a career change. So we wanna like get rid of all those barriers. We have an interest-free loan as well that students can use during, take out during that time. And then they go into a five month paid internship with one of our paid, with one of our company partners. And it, during that internship time, that's where they're con gonna continue taking CS fundamentals. We have a program called Thursdays at Ada where they're, the students are working normal during the week. And then on Thursday afternoon, they actually take time away from their work to learn more CS fundamentals because we know that that is important, super important to their career. Why I'm here, why I love the work I'm doing as being someone that is from a small town and didn't have a lot of access to economic opportunity is we, we are all about economic justice. That means we are all about getting people from a salary where they're maybe making 45,000 to getting them to a, up to a six figure salary afterwards. We really want to transform students' economic opportunities because we know that if we can change that economic opportunity for one, it improves it for their entire community and then it just helps all of us. All of our students are women or gender expansive. That's one of the requirements to come into our program. 46% of our students are underrepresented minorities in tech. That means they are black, Latine, indigenous American, native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander. And then 82% of our students are people of color. Our program is actually really successful. Um, we have only been around for eight years and our placement rate, we are currently in our 16th cohort. Our placement rate overall has been 92%. And in our last, uh, grad, in our last um, cohort that graduated, at graduation day, 90% of those students were placed. So we know that those jobs are out there um, for students who are studying computer science fundamentals. And we also have a really high graduation rate because we are not successful if we're just bringing people in and then not actually helping them get through to graduation. And the pandemic, uh, since the pandemic started, we have had one student leave the classroom phase of the program. Only one student has um, dropped out of the program. I know that y'all are dealing with a lot of the transitions during the pandemic as well. And I just wanna say, I totally empathize with all of you because it's really, really hard to meet, meet students where they are and to help them with whatever they need. That's a little bit about Ada. And now I want to I want to teach you a little bit about who comes to Ada, because this is this is interesting in theory, but it's all about the people. This is Stacy. Stacy was a fitness instructor who really 
when she learned about that she could actually become a programmer, she really wanted to come to Ada. And she uh, tried to get in three times. And so that's, that's almost uh, two years of her life trying to get into Ada. And when she finally got in, she was so excited. She started weekly book clubs. She started all different kinds of social activities and things like that as well. And now she is a software develop, development development engineer at Amazon uh, and super, she's super excited. She just recently graduated. And then this is Lee down here. Lee was an office manager and an editor and she, and, and Lee is someone who loves solving problems, but couldn't find that right job to help solve problems. And once they found their path to becoming a software engineer, they were super excited. And um, Lee is now a software engineer at Outreach. And uh, something I was going to say about Lee is that um, Lee and Stacy both come back and volunteer at Ada. I have to say that um, not everyone realizes that this is a path for them, and not everyone knows that someone that looks like them can be in tech. And so it's really important when and when our alum um, are successful that they come back and help other students either by mentoring them about what it's like to work in tech about um, volunteering with our admissions process or volunteering as a TA or a tutor in the class. And these are two of our amazing TAs um, and volunteers that come back into the classroom a lot to help our students. This is Manu. Um, Manu was a video producer from a small town in Hawaii. And when she found out about um, Ada, she just was super excited and applied and luckily got in, I think, on her first try. And she is one of our interns. So as I said, you know, there's a five month internship process. She is in the second month of her internship. And what we do with that is um, about halfway through the internship process, we actually survey all of the companies to see if our students are on track for employment and that the students that aren't on track for employment, we actually work um, have a career coach that works with them to get their resumes up, to get their GitHub repos in order, to make sure that they are going to be hire, a hireable dev in market. Because like I said, our ultimate goal is to get people placed into industry. Um, over here, I have Lynn. Lynn worked at, as a job coach and a massage therapist. Lynn learned about, about um, software engineering from one of her massage clients, actually. Um, and they found out that this was a career option and she was really thinking about it and thinking, wow, if, if, I, if this person can do this, I can, I can do this too. Um, and started talking, like they built up a rapport and they decided that that's something that, they, that um, she realized that that was a career path for her. She was also a job coach that was using Indeed um, to help her clients find jobs. And now she is a software engineer at Indeed. So I just think that that is a kind of a fun full life cycle story. We have over 500 other stories like this about students who came to us from a roundabout path, right? They wanted to come in, they did not know tech was an option for them. And once they found out it was, they became very passionate and very much wanted to be a part of this um, industry. So something that I think that um, that's really important is like, of those 500, like people came from, like there were auto mechanics, massage therapists, yoga instructors, all of these variety of things coming in to realize that this is a path for them. And um, uh, something I was gonna say, that the, our alum now actually help us find other students out there that really want to come to Ada and really want to change their careers and their paths as well. And something that each of these people have had, have, been able to do is not only change their own individual path, but a lot of them support their families uh, with their increased income. And they, they needed their families and their community to know that they had the courage to change and the courage to build a better future for themselves as well as their community. And this is where I just wanted to give a shout out to all of you. All of our students wish that they would have learned that they were able to code earlier in their careers. And so I just want to thank each and every one of you for the work you are doing right now to teach CS fundamentals, to bring more people like Stacy and Lee and Lynn and Manu into this industry, because we definitely need all of their voices in this industry as well as all of yours. 
I also want you to, I like to end with a little bit of a reflection. I would like you to think about a student who might not realize their potential right now. And I was just curious, like, curious if you want to think of one way you can support them as we move forward. And I'm going to, I'm going to stop there and I'm going to see if you all have any questions. Thank you all so much for listening. Thank you for uh, being here with us, Bethany. Um, I, I think one of the, the things is, is that I, I didn't learn about Ada Academy, Ada Academy until, oh, I want to say two or three years ago um, when Crystal Hess um, yes. came, came to work with you. Um, so how do people get to know about Ada Academy? This is, um, we've only been around for eight years. We've only uh, been in existence for eight years. And uh, right now we are in this very big expansion phase. That is something else I just wanted to let you all know. We are, um, yeah, get them to look. I'm, I'm reading the chat. I got to stop reading the chat. But we are, uh, we're, right now we have a <laughs> Seattle campus. Um, and since the pandemic, obviously, now we have a digital campus. And so we've expanded to these two. And recently we were recip recipients of the um, Equality Can't Wait uh, grant. So we just recently received a $10 million grant where we are actually expanding nationwide. And our goal is to have regional hubs across the country. So we want to have a regional hub in Atlanta, uh, a DC area after that. So next year we're going to Atlanta and the year after we're going to go to DC. So we are really working to expand and people find out about us from friends of friends. We are actually starting finally for the first time our, our first marketing outreach campaign. We've never really had to do that before because it's usually just been word of mouth. Um, but we're realizing that there is a need for us to get some more marketing out there as well. All right, great. Um, do we have any questions for Bethany in the chat? Um, I, I always like the the idea of it being named the Ada Academy. So are you really um, named after the Ada Lovelace? Is that we, it because it's for women? Yes, we were named after Ada Lovelace, who is one of the first, uh, y'all probably know this better than I do, one of the first uh, computer um, engineer or com one of the first people, women to work on, a, um, on a, designing a computer. And we actually just recently celebrated Ada Lovelace um, Day. Yes. Which is, yeah. uh, which is nice. Okay. Perfect. So we have a couple questions coming in. Uh, I have one from uh, Dr. Amy Coe. What experiences have your students had with CS education before Ada, if any? Were they experiences that encouraged them or deterred them? That is a great question. So a lot of our students haven't had any experiences with CS Fun before. And we do require them to have some coding, like they do have to be able to code a little bit um, before they can come into Ada. So a lot of them ha don't even, like I said, they didn't know it was a career path. They didn't know this was a thing um, that they could do. They thought it was something that other people could do and that they couldn't. Um, I actually had one student, just like she started crying when she got her first job offer because she's like, I really thought I could only be like a social justice, like, Act, activist, I did not realize that I could actually um, become a software developer. And any experiences that encouraged them or deterred them? I think that's a great question. And I think that a lot of them just don't have that experience. And once they find this route, um, they are super motivated and super passionate and really wanna stick with it. Can you uh, expand just in a generic way yeah. around ways that you feel that students can get experiences even before Ada Academy that could help encourage them. Because I know a lot of these are educators that are trying to bring CS K-12. Yep. Uh, so what are some things that you see as ways to help students get encouraged with CS? Yeah, I think showing that it's not this, I think a lot of our students are scared of math, just so you know, like a lot of them have like this big math phobia. And once you show them like it's actually doable, it's you anyone can do this it's approachable right um 
I think that just showing like showing it at a basic level that it's that it is attainable for anyone and then showing um I think another thing is like seeing other people that look like you in careers like just showing the different the variety of people that can be like this right um because I think a lot of people just think this is for this is for really smart men so that's what this is I think that's that's a very stereotypical answer but that's something that a lot of our students came in thinking and then when they come in and they see others that look like them and are really successful in their career they're like oh wait maybe i can do this and this is a path that i can actually do yeah great yeah. what are some of the barriers for students to remain in the program that is a great question i have to say taking six months with no income is a terrifying thing for a lot of people so that is definitely a barrier and we used, uh, prior to last year, we had, you can take out a loan, but it was, it had interest. It was, you were um, mm -hmm. getting interest on that loan. So what we did is we really worked to find a partner where we have an interest-free loan for students now, um, but the program does not cost anything. Uh, the other, we just tried to like really think about all the barriers. Another thing is having a really expensive computer. You do have to have a nice Mac. Um, so what we did to, to, for that one is we actually got a lot of, a lot of donations from a lot of air, uh, businesses in the area and just give our students max. If they don't have a nice computer, we're like, here you go. And we give that to them from the time that they're accepted into the program to, uh, so they can practice on their pre-course and just get their settings and get their, uh, get everything set up the way that they need to get it set up. That's a great question. Yes, representation matters. I say that like multiple times a week. <laughs> and yeah, and, and just making math accessible to people. I think that, and people hear stories from others. And so I think our stories really matter and what we tell people really matter. Um, and what you all are doing right now is really, really, really mm -hmm. important. Because I think any one of these students, like I said, they would have come down this career path had they known that was an option. And you all are making that an option for them. So please keep keep doing what you're doing every day. I, I think one of the things too about this, and, and I wonder about your academy, is that there's a fear of computer science. There's a fear that it's, it's too difficult, it's too hard. Um, do you have to overcome any of that with your students? Yes, we do. We have a special, um, we have, not only, we have not only the technical curriculum, we also have social justice related things as well as personal development. So one of the one of the talks that we give in the first week is about imposter syndrome. It's about no one ever knows what they're doing. I, that's something that was really helpful for me to hear. Like you're, you don't always have to be the expert. And frankly, you don't want to be the expert half the time. You want to bring those people around you because, because they're going to make you better. So we really work with our students to say like, listen, you're not gonna know all the answers and that's okay. It's really about like how you approach the problem solving. Um, Kevin's question here about the first candidate who had applied three times. So Kevin, this is really what the problem I'm working to solve right now is scaling our program. Because we, when I first started at Ada, I've been there for two years, uh, we only had 48 seats and in those 48 seats, we would get 300 to 400 applicants for those seats. Now, I'm, we've built it out where now we actually have um, 96 seats. We have a D Seattle program as well as a digital program. And then we're working to expand that out. So that way, people who want to come to ADA and are qualified to come to ADA can come. I don't want it to be this really exclusive you have to test in, you have to know the right people, any of that. We really want it to be attainable for people. I think that message echoes in education. Computer science, we've talked about stereotypes uh, yesterday during Dr. Amy Coe's presentation as well. And I'm also echoing Kimberly's comment that she loves that you address imposter sy syndrome. Um, I think in education, computer science, we're trying to do a K-12 implementation. And there's a ton of students, parents, community members that think computer science is not attainable. So could you talk about that briefly? Yes, this is, I think this is the mind sh shift, mindset shift that we all need to have, um, is that this is an obtainable career. And the reason these jobs are so lucrative is because they need people in these jobs. 
So that is where I, that's the whole shift in all of this. It's like they are paying really well, because, but not because it's so hard and it's so out there that people can't do it. It's because there is a there's a shortage of workers that are able to do these jobs. So if you just get the right skills, then you can get in there and do this short it, do fulfill that that gap. Um, and that way you can you can do whatever all these other students can do as well. And I think that it's easier to change kids' minds than parents' minds. I mean, you all probably know this way better than I do. <laughs> I, I always work with adults, but it's easier to get kids to see themselves in that, right? So as long as you can change the kids' minds and make it approachable for kids, um, that I know it gets so much easier for them to for them to convince their parents instead of you instead of us trying to do that. Mm -hmm. So the question here is: Do you have success graduates who get to living in the smaller, more rural communities that represent them? Yes, Sue. I love this question. I am from a small town. I have major small town love. Um, and uh, Lee, the student that I showed here, was from a small town in um, in Oregon. And we actually, we have like a lot of different criteria that we're really trying to bring into tech because we really want tech, the, 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 the face to change. We're not only looking at racial demographics, we're looking at LGBTQIA plus community as well as low income. So we really want to bring all the people that currently it feels like it's really out there and not obtainable for them. We really want to get them involved. So um, we definitely do have some successful graduates who are from small communities doing this. And I would say our digital program is actually really good for this now, because right now, like with the pandemic, you can be anywhere. A lot of jobs are online. And so that's what's really that's changed the game for us. Um, and I, I feel like that's going to change the game for a lot of people is that you could be in Marionville, Missouri and working at a job at Amazon and making a really, really great salary. Um, and you don't have to move to Seattle to do that. So that's a great question, Sue. Uh, I'm excited to learn more uh, about your, your academy. Um, I, I think it's a start. Um, um, I'm so excited that you're going to expand um, and, and you have those funds to do that. Um, you know, 96 students is, is, is just a drop in the bucket, but we have to start somewhere. We have to encourage them, you know, yeah. to uh, try these new, new things. Um, and that is possible. Yeah. So thank you very much for, for your work. Thank you all for all your work. And I know we only have 96 students now, but you all have so much more than that. So please keep doing the work that you all are doing because it's great. Wonderful. Thank you for being here. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Okay, so with that, uh, if we can give Bethany some thanks in the chat and do not go anywhere because we're going to move on to the next piece of this before our session starts. So don't leave. Let's just give Bethany some thanks. Um, and then we will get started with our next portion. Thank you all so much. So with that, I believe next we're going to do some logistics uh, and talk about things that are happening throughout today. Um, and then we will begin by introducing the different strands and sessions you can attend. So we're going to start with logistics. So if I can invite Joel to come back on screen or Shannon, whoever wants to take it off next. I'm here. Perfect. So Joel, let's do some logistics. We're talking prizes? Yep. Okay, so a lot of people have been following my lead when I'm putting it in the chat to fill out the address form link that's on the participant experience website under the prize section so that we have your address on file so we can easily go into the office and put your stuff in a box and get your prizes to you. I've done some drawings already, but we're gonna announce those later, is that correct? Right, we'll announce it at the end. Um, and uh, there's lots of great stuff. We have micro bit kits that are a full classroom kit. We really decided this year we wanted people to 
have something they could use with students or with learners. So we wanted to bundle things together. Um, yeah, and I'm just really looking forward to uh, people getting a surprise of being able to have a whole classroom kit of micro bits because that really expands the possibilities of what you might be able to do rather than just getting one to play around with. Perfect. Thank you, Joel. And Shannon, do you want to talk about what's happening the rest of today and then we'll get started in the specific strands? So uh, with with the sessions and that uh, um, today, we um, we do have the capture of the flag um, that is happening um, as well. And you will see that um, this really is about um, anybody who can do that. Um, it, it's not for just people who are coding. It's it's all about some cybersecurity and, um, you know, how, how do you work in Google? There's all sorts of questions in there. Um, prizes will be going out to those with the uh, highest points, um, but that can be anybody. So uh, please uh, take a look at the capture of the flag. It's really fun. And there's a lot of information in there too that would be great to share with your students. We also have a, um, a participant experience uh, website. The link should be on the left side of your screen down at the bottom. Um, and Joel has, has created this for us. Uh, Joel, do you want to talk just a second on the, the participant experience? Yeah, the website has some stuff if you want to take a break. So if you're in a session and you're transitioning to another session, you just need a mental break. There is some really good short brain breaks um, and uh, yoga in under like 10 or 15 minutes to just do at your desk. Uh, there's also the capture the flag game is embedded directly on the participant experience website and all the information about the prizes as well. So I encourage people to, to check it out to use it. The website's not going anywhere. So throughout the rest of the weekend, if you want to use any of the resources that are on there, uh, or just engage with it to take a little bit of a break from processing all of the awesome stuff that we're getting from the summit sessions. Um, that's what it's there for. There's also answers to some clock hour questions under Summit Logistics on that page. And we noticed we get a lot of clock hour questions near the time when the sessions are wrapping up and stuff. So you can at least check that out and get a little bit of information that might help answer um, anything, but you can always reach out to the organizers as well. Thank you. And to find that page, once again, when you're on the main hop-in screen, which is here, so this is not where you're at now, right now you're in our stage. But when you're on the main screen, over here on the left is the menu. This is where you can find everything. So I need to refresh because there's new buttons. When you look at these buttons, they kind of explain what they are. So the main one is reception schedule. When you scroll down, you can see the schedule for today. Keynote and stages, that's where you're at now. This button is live sessions. Only sessions that are happening now will be in this area. So, so to see the full schedule, go to reception schedule, slow, scroll down. Sessions that are happening at that moment, click live sessions. There's the networking area, which a number of you used last night, and I've heard it was fabulous, so great. Uh, here's more about the capture of the flag. This is where you do it. Replay, I turned on. You can watch our keynote from yesterday. This keynote will be here as soon as it's over. And then the last button takes you to that participant experience website. So once again, it's the very bottom one and it takes you to the participant experience website. Okay. Anything else we want to do before we start going into our strands? See, any questions? Okay, um, so we have uh, broken the strands up. Uh, there are four strands and um, we've, we've broken them up so that we'll do strand one and two in the morning and then strand three and four. But uh, beforehand, what we wanna do is kind of introduce you to those strands, um, uh, what they are um, and, and what you can expect uh, from the presentations in those strands. Um, and I also, I uh, want to assure you that there are going to be some recordings, so don't worry about missing anything. Um, it's uh, it's going to be available. Uh, I'm not quite sure how fast, but we're going to make it available. And um, and and so um, 
choose something that looks interesting. Uh, we don't mind if you go in and out of session, so please no apologies for interrupting. You're not interrupting. This is a great plat platform. Um, so I think we want to start. Andrew? Perfect. So what we're going to do is we're going to start before the sessions begin by once again introducing strands one and two. Now, the way the strands work is one and two are this morning. And anything under those strands you can take between uh, the time frames. So the first thing is we're going to talk about strand one. So I'm going to introduce that and give a little background. But really, I want to hear from you. Let's make this a little more interactive. So strand one is called computer science improves student learning. So anything under strand one will be to help instruct you on how computer science improves student learning. We want to think about competencies, literacies, and 21st century skills. So I'm going to ask you to put in the chat some of your ideas. So let's just start with the first one, the breakdown of those. So for you, how does computer science education practices enhance student learning in other subjects? Let's put a couple ideas in the chat. How do computer science education practices enhance student learning in other subjects? What do you think? Go ahead and put some of your responses. And there's no wrong answer to this. So put anything in the chat. How does computer science education practices enhance student learning in other subjects? Problem solving, persistence, iteration, computational thinking, learning how to learn, computational thinking, procedural decomposition. How else? problem solving, abstract thinking, okay? thinking and reasoning. Ooh, Lauren's got a number of them. Communication, collaboration, creativity, breaking down larger problems into smaller pieces, teamwork. Dr. Ko, that was her topic last night. Agreed. Refining research. These practices allow students to think more logically and find patterns. Okay, so I'm going to give another about 30 seconds, and then we're going to go to the next one. Okay, students in poverty do not have access to computers yet to have them do all the state testing. The more competent and comfortable students are with computers, the more successful they can be. I think that's even beyond state test as well. Making informed decisions, vocabulary. Yes, that's a big one too. Okay, so let's take a pause there. Let's move on to the next one, the next topic under strand one. Integrating technology and computing into 21st century citizenship. So how does computer science integrate technology and computing into 21st century citizenship? What are some ideas that you have? Making connections between what they see in their class and in their life. And empowering students to create. Perfect. I like that Chad's up there said resiliency, critical thinking skills all the time. And you'll notice none of these have really been all about coding. I haven't I haven't heard a lot of programming or coding yet. This is about other things. Developing a strong culture for learning. Oh, David's hit one of my favorites, having student voice. Mm -hmm. Picking the right tool to solve the right problem. Perfect. Social impact of computing. Okay, so I'm gonna take a pause here. Let's now switch and have you share some core ideas in modern computer science for teachers. So this is another thing that we're going to do in this strand is talk about core ideas in modern CS for teachers. What do you think that could mean? 
core ideas in modern CS for teachers. Tech is the future. I find myself being left behind, although I've always been pretty adept. I think one of the things there that's very strong is it's teaching that resiliency, which was mentioned before. So modern CS for teachers, we need to be resilient, adapt, uh, and also willing to fail. Computer science is all about failing as well. Computer science for all, no gatekeeping, problem-based learning. Perfect. Okay, so I'm gonna pause there and move on to the next piece. So we did a little bit of research behind how computer science improves learning. So this is from research that we found. These are just some key bullets and just pulling them out. Research shows that computer science helps students acquire skills such as computational thinking, problem solving, and collaboration, which you've mentioned quite a few times in the chat. Computer science is an important element in strengthening existing educational models and preparing students for the future. So I want to read that again. Strengthening existing educational models and preparing students for the future. I would elaborate that it's also creating new educational models as well. Help students beyond computing. So computer science education is more than just computing, which you've shown as educators as innovators, technology is accessible, uh, it's social emotional learning. You, you've mentioned that a few times in the chat. And lastly, promises to significantly enhance student preparedness for the future of work and active citizenship. Okay. So strand one is all about computer science improving student learning. So if you take a session between 1040 and 1140, which is coming up relatively soon, you're going to see things that help with think about computer science improving student learning. So we have sessions, for example, computer science and PBL. So we actually had projects-based learning or problem-based learning, Dan mentioned that in the chat. So we have a session around computer science and projects-based learning. Common ground, social emotional learning and computing education. You mentioned that as well. So there's a session specifically around social emotional learning. And then computer science for all, curriculum and certification. So once again, computer science improves student learning is strand one. So any of those sessions that are labeled strand one between 1040 and 1140 a.m. you can take and you'll get some information now if you don't want to take any of these sessions we also have strand two going at the same time but don't worry every session is being recorded and will be in the replay area so if there's ones that you want to attend at the same time but you can't be multiple places at once then you can go watch the replay area and you can watch them anytime you want. We will also be putting them online later. So with that, we have our next guest, Lisa, who is going to introduce strand two for us. And I'm gonna stop sharing and welcome Lisa to the screen. Lisa, welcome. And you wanna introduce strand two. Sure. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen here. Uh, are we good on the, the screen? Sorry. It Just looks great. Sure. Okay, yep. great. Okay. So, um, Good morning. Just to, to give you a little bit of a background on who I am, my name is Lisa Bramer. I'm a data scientist at PNNL. And um, this event is particularly um, close to my heart, just to give you an idea of the journey that I sort of took um, 
I grew up in a rural town in Minnesota, population of 1,200, <clears throat> and I'm of an age such that computers weren't huge when I was in school. So I moved to um, Purdue University, got a bachelor's of statistics in um, or in, of science and mathematics and statistics, and the entire reason that I got a double major was in college. I hated computer science. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that I was never exposed to anything to do with computer science at all. And so after um, I switched to a double major, which required less computer science, and then uh, decided to go to graduate school, got my master's and PhD in statistics, where I learned that uh, I couldn't escape computer science at all. And that in order to do anything I wanted to do, I had to know how to program. So I did eventually grow to, to learn to like it quite a bit. After graduate school, I moved to, to PNNL. And so um, in terms of strand two, we're talking about how computer science will fosters sort of innovation, scientific discovery, and, and why it's useful there. So just to give you a little bit more background on the types of problems that I myself work on um, and and what we work on at PNNL. So I work on, I'm a data scientist, so a statistician by training, but they call me a data scientist now. And some of the cool things that I get to work on are things like human health research, uh, where I have disease biomarkers and therapeutic targets via machine learning for omics data. So um, <clears throat> we've got some environmental research that I do and visualization methods for large and complex data. And I also work on national security applications. So um, in strand two, we really want to talk about why students should learn CS and um, when it comes to innovation and problem solving. So at its core, I think computer science requires problem solving, critical thinking, and innovation. And these are core skills for life, regardless of the career path that you take. And we live in an information age where there's lots of, of data science. So and data is everywhere and we need to be able to make sense of it. And as some someone representing a place that, you know, where we do a lot of innovation and scientific discovery, I can tell you that these types of problems require innovative and deployable solutions everywhere. So I think at Strand 2, we'll talk a lot about why, why computer science is going to help foster some of these innovative and deployable solutions how it lends itself to some of these big challenging problems that we face in the world when it comes to both research and when you know places like PNNL tackle problems that are of importance to things like national security, biology, and all of those um, really hard problems that students who can learn how to program and feel comfortable how to program and get exposure um, unlike maybe when I was growing up, are going to have an advantage to to be able to participate and and contribute to those things. So I think that is all that I have for right now. Except that I can't find the stop sharing button. Sorry. There you go, Lisa. So we have a question in the chat for you from Cheryl. Sure. Uh, and this is an opinion. Do we need to be computer science leaders today to be a successful teacher? What do you think? I don't think so. I think that, um, you know, really being able to foster skill sets like problem solving and thinking about logic and, um, you know, taking that analytical approach to things, those are the core things that are at the heart of CS. And so you don't need to be an expert in programming in order in order to help a student learn those types of skill sets. Perfect. Any other questions in the chat for Lisa? Before we talk about what sessions you can attend in strand two. Okay, 
I think one is coming. Can you give an example of when computer science pushed an innovation in another areas? Yeah, I definitely can do that. Let me, um, sorry, I'll, I'll do this annoying thing and show my screen again. So um, I have some examples pulled up here too. Um, so <clears throat> I'll tell you that I, I work on um, a lot of different problems and I've, I've kind of put a couple in here. So thanks for the question. And um, so one thing that you'll notice on the left here is uh, this giant looking instrument. And this is an instrument that can measure things at uh, an atomic scale. And honestly, as a, a statistician, I don't understand any of the science or not much of the science behind that. But this instrument takes measurements and um, we were able to collect data from that where we're looking at a battery here and what's happening in the process of a battery and um, these chemists need to understand what happens in the charging and discharging cycle of a, a battery but you can only see about one percent of an image of what's going on and so we were able to take um, they're one percent of this image that's in the middle here and we came up with some very very basic summary statistics about the value like the grayscale values there and what it turns out is that we could actually try to quantitate things like how how much calcium buildup you see on this battery and once we understand something like that, we can program that information so that the instrument can see that and, and the instrument can start to take measurements at very specific locations. We actually um, got a patent off of this work because it was something that no one had ever thought about. So this is, you know, one example of a very basic rudimentary. There's nothing magical happening. We're just looking at grayscale values, but being able to take these estimates and program them up into the instrument to show that then help dictate how the instrument operates. That was super useful. And um, the other thing that um, I will say is um, we've got some key areas. So we have, I work with a lot of biologists um, and those biologists aren't necessarily always super computer savvy, but um, in this case, we're looking at things like pathogens and trying to understand what they do in terms of effects to human health. And I was actually part of this, this project where we used machine learning. And the reason we use machine learning is when you are looking at things like pathogens, they will take those measurements, put them through instruments. So those instruments um, return thousands to tens of thousands of potential um, proteins in your body that might be um, affected by this pathogen. And you can imagine that going through those proteins one at a time by hand and trying to understand what's happening is just not feasible. So using things like computer science, machine learning to really get an understand of how these different proteins are interacting with one another and what's happening to them as they're exposed to a pathogen. Um, we've been able to then take that information and target some of those proteins and that's how we end up with things like um, therapeutic targets. So if you think about even things like COVID, right, it's the same process where being able to use computer science, program things, and and implement some of these algorithms really can help identify biological targets that could be potential um, therapeutic targets that biologists then can go and try to design drugs for. So I think it's a great question. We have lots of examples of these uh, types of applications where just the amount of information and data that's coming out in a biological example or when you think about the electric grid 
that amount of data just can't be handled by parsing things in spreadsheets and really know, knowing how to program in computer programming languages facilitates discovery of these these types of things. Okay, we have another question from Catherine. So we had a question yesterday from a rural district about getting students who are from farming families interested in computer science. Can you talk about how innovation in agriculture might apply? Yeah, definitely. So um, I think this happens in agriculture uh, more than people realize. So, you know, there are lots of things, uh, one being, you know, um, thinking about genetic engineering of, of plants so that they're particularly adept at growing and thriving in certain um, regions or temperature zones. And there's also now that we have things like drones and, and planes that can fly over and get aerial maps of things, we can implement computer science and machine learning to start to think about where are the optimal places to grow crops? How do we crop cycle from year to year? Um, so there are a lot of optimization and things that are happening that are facilitated by computer science in terms of just even, you know, how does a farmer get the most bang for their buck for their land and what to do with it and or what types of, of crops can they plant? Okay, we have this comment from Lawrence, I think is important to share out. Uh, my personal thought is introducing even simple data science problems like finding maximum or mean of a set of numbers in a variety of subjects is a way of introducing CS concepts to all students. Wanna talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I, I think this, so the, the practice here really is to think about if I've got a bunch of information and how do I summarize that? If you ask a student, you know, how to give them a list of data and you ask them what what does a typical value look like you know let's suppose that we're if, if we go back to the crop example and we're saying here's you know here's how much money a particular farmer made from from year to year how much money can they expect to make next year based on this data um, trying to figure that out and code up and say like well what what's sort of like the average value or a maximum or a minimum starts to get us to into those very basic concepts of what computer science and data science can do um, and can do way more efficiently than if you hand a student a calculator and ask them to calculate that by hand i think they can start to see the power of computer science as well when you do that Thank you, Lisa. Uh, Dan had a comment about being concerned about a seasoned, asking a seasoned teacher to embrace computer science in their instruction. Um, what do you think about that? So I would say that, um, you know, on whether that seasoned teacher maybe um, can appreciate that, that we are transitioning to an, a, well, we're already sort of in the information age, right? But we it's not going anywhere. Uh, we continue to have, have more and more problems that require computer science. And so, you know, I would say that embracing computer science may look different for uh, different instructors, uh, depending on levels of experience. But we had the question previously, you know, do you need to be an expert in computer science to start to teach students? Um, and and you don't need to be. And so I would I would just respond and say that there are small steps, just like, you know, the previous point that was made that that instructors can take in thinking about introducing some of these concepts into their class, even if it it doesn't have to mean full out that everyone has to teach a full computer science class in the classroom, right? But those concepts of logic and problem solving and even i would i would say like how do we interpret data as it comes in as somebody who's a data scientist you know handing someone a bunch of numbers and really asking them what does this mean in the context of of what i've given you all of those concepts really start to get at the types of skill sets that are needed um, to really for a student 
is to be able to start to think about computer science types of problems. And there's a lot of uh, things in the chat agreeing with that, Lisa, and we're having uh, that they're loving this conversation. I would agree with you as talking about integrating computer science and Catherine brought up even at an early age, elementary teachers is a great way to start. So introducing things like computational thinking, right. which is one of the computer science foundations and which includes things like problem solving or critical thinking, um, different ways to look at a problem. I mean, I've seen a kindergarten classroom teach computer science where a kid puts a bucket on his head and pretends to be a robot and does a map. I mean, those type of things can help us integrate computer science that's not as scary uh, thinking about it because it's not just coding and programming. That's not all computer science is. So I, I think this conversation is going well. I see another question coming from a rural area. We see a lot of crops coming and going. One field had a corn for several years. Now that field has hops. The question to the students would be, why did the farmer switch to hops? Right, yeah, and that that gets at, um, that gets at, right, um, how do we use the land? And I'm sure at some point someone has data that shows that if you grow the same crop over and over in the same field every year, that your production goes down. Um, and so th thinking about, you know, that it starts to really get into like understanding the land. But if you can provide some sort of evidence to a student that, you know, would demonstrate that, that really gets them to thinking about why that, that might be important. I can say as, um, somebody who came from a very, very rural area and who was not exposed to a lot of computer science um, and my initial hatred of computer science, it was all fostered and it was something I didn't know how to do. I wasn't good at thinking about because I didn't have any practice like thinking along those lines or having applications that are particularly were particularly relevant to me in my life at that time. So providing students with examples of things like uh, the point that was just brought up can be much more impactful and really get them thinking about, you know, if at the end of their, their education, they say, well, I, I want to farm, they still have some of these skill sets to think about how do I do that the best that I can, even if they're not going to be computer scientists, they're still going to need to know how to use technology and think about looking at the information that they get every year about the amount of money that they're making and how to utilize their land best. So, um, you know, even if at the end of the day, not every student is going to become a computer scientist, having those types of problem solving and critical thinking skills are going to be important to their success as human beings as well. Thank you, Lisa, very, very much. Um, we have a lot of other comments, things like uh, the curriculum just needs to start including it uh, in basic ways like equity. My middle school kids are making a farming simulation game in Make Code, Makey Code, Arcade, right? Um, I encourage teachers to read Mathematical Mindsets by Joe Bowler. It showed me how to see teaching of mathematics in a different way as you might see computer science the same. Um, so things like this, uh, we have one from Isaac. So I love the conversation around starting as early as kindergarten with unplugged activities, even introducing terms like sequencing when learning patterns or debugging when a problem solving lowers the bar for those kids as they get older. Okay. So great conversations. Um, thank you so much. Anne Wright Mockler, um, we at PNNL have led two workshops for teachers that integrated data visualization, ideas with content. Such a great program. And uh, thank you, PNNL, for being such great partners to our state. And I, I just add one last comment as, as someone who um, is more, came more at it from the statistics and mathematics side of things, as a lot of the skill sets in computer science um, also lend themselves to math. So as students are going through um, school, 
those problem solving and analytical skills in the mathematical classroom also translate. And so it, it serves a dual purpose in that way as well. And is going to, um, you know, those, I remember being in elementary and high school and really hating word problems, for example. And right, like those skills of like thinking through a word problem, what information do I have? Where do I need to go? That problem solving. That aligns with math, but it also aligns with computer science and really, um, you know, you're, you're doing students a, a double or triple service by really getting them involved in those types of thought processes early. And we can always use more really great data science folks where we're at PNNL and at other places as well. So. Well, uh, from myself, as well as our entire team and everybody who participating today, thank you, Lisa for introducing strand two for us. Uh, yep, wonderful, welcome. great comments, great conversation. So thank you for joining us. Feel free to stay on for a second. Yeah, uh, thanks for having I'm, me. I'm gonna share my screen and talk about the sessions you can take that address what Lisa just introduced with strand two. So strand two is officially called Computer Science Drives Technological, Social and Scientific Innovation, which is what Lisa just addressed. The sessions that you can attend from 1040 to 1140 this morning are why cybersecurity, coding in Minecraft, immersive CS curriculum, computer science for the content classroom for grades three through 12, community of practice, and I believe that one's done by Avid, and then prepare students for the massive demand in STEM for free. So those sessions will get towards what was just mentioned in strand two make sure you attend at 1040. Now, before you go anywhere, and thank you once again, Lisa, we're going to bring Joel back on screen. And Lisa, feel free to stay if you'd like. Joel's going to pick a winner of one of the prizes before we let you go take a break before 1040. So Joel, come on back and let's announce our winner. Uh, oh, there I am. Um, okay, so we're starting to do some random drawings for folks that are that gave us their address and are also in Hoppin today, and we're really happy to have everyone's engagement. So the first winner is winning a Spark Fun Paper Circuits Classroom Pack. So it comes with 30 fun, innovative light-up robot cards, and you don't need to solder or code anything. Um, and this starts as a paper circuits thing to get people really interested in that kind of computational thinking and um, yeah, the kind of early starting points of that. So the first winner of that is Jennifer Hedegaard. So, so Jennifer that's very exciting. We have some winners and some prizes going out. And once again, this is a classroom pack, which means that you can try to integrate this within your classroom. It's a spark fun paper circuits classroom pack. So congratulations to Jennifer. And there's going to be a lot more prizes throughout this summit and we will do drawings throughout the day. Thank you, Joel, very much. Thank you. And with that, our first sessions begin at 1040. So between now and 1040, we have two requests and I'm gonna bring everybody back on screen. So I'll stop sharing my screen. Got to go to the right window. So let's bring everybody back on. So between now and 1040, please make sure you go get a cup of coffee. I think that's highly important. Take a stretch break. And then at 1040, your first sessions start once again, they will be in the live sessions area. You click there and you see what's going. You can choose anything from strand one and strand two. And if there's multiple sessions you want to attend, don't forget they're gonna be in the replay area later. So you're not gonna miss anything. Shannon, Catherine, Joel, Lisa, anything else to add before we let them go? Take a quick break before 1040? Nope, go get that coffee. Yes, <laughs> coffee is important. So thank you all. Have a great morning, and we will see you in sessions at 1040. I hope you pick something that interests you. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa, very much.